Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC212, Christian Apologetics. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen. All right, so let's compare uh, the belief systems between the Christian faith and Islam. So God, when you talk about God, we believe in the one eternal triune God. The Muslims believe in Allah, one eternal God. Now, this is very important. They don't have a concept of a triune God. So, the moment we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, fully confused. Because they don't have that reference. So, or we say triune God, one God, three persons. How can God, how can there be three gods? You know, it's very. So, we must be careful. Uh, that this should not become a point, uh, not a main point when you're talking to a Muslim. Because it's difficult to help them understand one God in three persons, or triune God, or the God that even many Christians, believers themselves, don't understand it. So, I mean, cannot comprehend that. So uh, we should be careful. Don't use terms like, Triune God. Don't start talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. No. Just say God. Then understanding that revelation will come later when they, you know, when their heart is open. But now in the beginning, avoid that. Man, yeah, uh, we know we are sinful. Okay, Islam is okay. Basically, people are good. Uh, we have the Bible. In terms of scripture, we have the Bible. They have the Quran. Um, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, we, we say, you know, he, he's God who became man. So uh, in Islam, they accept Jesus as a prophet. But anything beyond that, very difficult to accept. To say he is God who became man. And especially when we use the term son of God, very difficult. Full confusion. So, um, the obvious question they'll ask is, you know, uh, why do you say Jesus is God? They accept he's a prophet. But why do we say that Jesus is God? Or did Jesus himself say he is God? Show us. You know, so we should be prepared for that uh, question. Be prepared to show that if it comes. But that would be a, 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 a point where they have uh, difficulty. Life's purpose for us is to grow in a personal relationship with God. Here is to submit to Allah. Uh, heaven, we, we talk about those who receive God's gift of salvation through Jesus. For them, it's those who are chosen by Allah. And hell, those who are rejected by Allah. So here's the difference. The common thing is they also believe in heaven and hell. The difference is, you go to heaven if Allah says okay. If Allah says no, you go to hell. So that means there is no guarantee, there is no assurance of salvation. Whereas you and I, as believers, we say we can know that we are saved. I have assurance. I can say I'm going to go to heaven. Muslim, if Allah says okay, I'll go. If he says no, no. Right. So I'll try to live a good life, but that there is no guarantee, there is no assurance of salvation. It depends upon what Allah decides. So that is one important point to keep in mind, right? About um, salvation. Now, we have to admit that a, a, a traditional Muslim, a practical,
practicing Muslim is a very devout person. It means they have lots of, uh, you know, it's almost, it's, it's like a discipline. So the uh, Islam simply means submission to God, one who submits. Uh, so it started about 600 AD and, uh, and uh, through the Prophet Muhammad, uh, who in Saudi Arabia uh, claimed to have received messages from God and so on. Now, if you get into the details of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, it is quite bad. But we should not, don't bring that up. Because either they will hit us or, <laughs> or <laughs> it will be very insulting. But it, the reality, that is the fact, that his life was not a very morally uh, good life or it wasn't uh, something you know we can point to and say that is the life of a prophet. But we don't, you know, don't bring it up. There's no need to do that uh, because we're not here to condemn. We're here to bring the gospel, the message of Jesus, in a non-condemning way, helping them understand the, the gospel. Right. So we don't want to uh, condemn and so on. Um, so what are the main uh, affirmations? Uh, I bear witness there is no God but God. I bear witness that Muhammad is the prophet of God. So two statements they'll make. There's only one God, Allah, and there's only one prophet, Muhammad. Yes, I, Muhammad is his prophet. That's it. So like imagine if you have trained to say those two lines from the time you were young, even if somebody taps you on the hand, those two lines will fall out. It's like there's one God, his name is Allah, he's Allah, and one prophet, Muhammad. Prophet is a moment. This is prophet. So, what are the five uh, pillars? Uh, what do they practice? They confess in the faith, which we just said. Pray five times a day. Give alms to the poor. Fast in the month of Ramadan. Go to Meccan pilgrimage, and uh, engage in holy war. Uh, it should be primarily against worldly loss, but it also jihad also extends to. Anything that, that you do in defense of your faith. Um, some other things that we just need to keep in mind is that, okay, th there are different sects in uh, Islam uh, where some are more strict than others uh, in, the, in the way they follow. And, and, and you know, we don't necessarily need to know everything about these different sects. Uh, in Islam, there is uh, Mufti, who is a local leader. And fatwa is any decision made by this leader in how they interpret the, uh, the Islamic faith to be applied in a certain situation. So uh, if the mufti issues a fatwa, you have to follow it. Follow whatever is said. You know. So it's almost like their life is based on these things, these directives of fatwa, the decisions that are made by the local leader, the mufti. Right? And um, uh, in Islam, there's this uh, unforgivable sin in ascribing someone equal to God, um, which we also, you know, we see even the Jews, uh, how could someone claim to be God? So that's something uh, we need to keep in mind. So how do we share Christ with the Muslim? What would be our main points? Now, like I said earlier, understand that there are different kinds of Muslims. Uh, not everybody is fundamental. Not everybody is going to, you know, go and do jihad. And not everybody is, you know, like in that same mindset. There are very modern Muslims who are open and they're thinking new, thinking differently. Uh, and even different, if you just look at how the Arab world is, there are, there are certain countries that are very fundamental, and then there are certain countries that are opening up. You know, uh, so change is happening even in the Muslim world. People are beginning to think differently, like especially in Saudi Arabia and so on. Things are changing. Right? They're changing. 
So, um, in, in relating to a Muslim, we want to understand where this particular individual is. You know, is he a fundamental or is he a modern type Muslim? So then we can present the gospel accordingly. Um, also, keep in mind that generally uh, they, they question the deity of Christ, his death and his resurrection. They will question. Okay, they don't believe. Like we said earlier, they accept Christ as a prophet, but not deity. They will not accept his death and resurrection. So these are points that they're trained to question. So we need to be able to uh, provide right answers. Now, the thing that, um, that we need to keep in mind is we cannot, don't try to get into arguments with a Muslim. There's no point. We can't argue our way out. If they are willing to listen, then we can share. And what should we point them to? Right? A couple of things here. One is to point to God as a loving creator, as a loving God. Because in the mind of a Muslim, God, Allah, Allah is somebody far away, powerful, distant. You just have to submit. So Islam simply means submission to Allah. Just do it. Just do what he says. The part of a loving God who wants to be your father, who wants to have a relationship with this, is very different. That we could even call God our father is very different. Because otherwise, traditionally, God, Allah, you just have to obey. Right? But to feel loved by God, you know, the nature of God, uh, and the relationship with God is something very different. So that's something we need to emphasize. For sin, once again, like what we had mentioned when we talk about Hindu, for, yeah, there is a concept of sin, but again, we are looking. Uh, the, the Muslim looks at sin from how it affects people, as opposed to it's affecting your relationship with God. That if you sin, you're disqualified from even knowing God or walking with God. You know, that, to understand that, oh, if I sin, I just offended you. I hurt some somebody. I did something wrong against you. No, it's more than that. We have to help them understand it offended God. It affects your relationship with for the Hindu, if you sin, it's bad karma. But I can compensate for it next day. I can do some good deeds. For the Muslim, if I sin, I'm affecting you. I'm not, they're not thinking about my, how it affects me and my relationship with God. That thought, that emphasis is not there. So that's why we need to bring that in. In both cases, we bring it in, but the perspective is different. One is about karma, and here it's about then I'm not affecting others about relationship with God. And this is where forgiveness comes in, that a Muslim understands the concept of forgiveness. It's based on God. But there is no guarantee. Like, if God, if Allah wants to forgive, He will forgive. But on what basis will He forgive? And second, can you have assurance that you're forgiven? No. Right? So there is the concept of forgiveness, but Allah will have to choose to forgive. But in the Christian faith, we have, we have a basis on which forgiveness is given, and we can know that we are forgiven. We know the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed me from all sin. I'm not guilty. I'm not under condemnation. We know that. No, that, that is not there in Islam. Right? The, concept, the how, on what basis. So this is where we can introduce the work of Christ on the cross. Um, I think I already mentioned this. The fatherhood of God, to establish that relationship with God, uh, is uh, is 
you know, you can come into that relationship with God as a father, God as a father, and we are his sons and daughters, right? Now, there was a book uh, written by uh, a Muslim lady a long time ago. Uh, it, it became very popular. Uh, her book was called, I Dared to Call Him Father. Hmm? Uh, Bill Krishik. So for her, just coming to know that you can call God your father was very powerful, which brought her to faith in Christ. And she suffered uh, and persecution, all of that, for her faith in Christ. But just to know that I can call God my father was a big revelation. So she wrote that, her, her journey to faith. Um, and do we emphasize that the Christian life is based on God's word and led by the Holy Spirit as opposed to you know, fatwas or decrees being issued by the local mufti. Okay. So these are the points of difference. Now, it is not easy to share the gospel with a Muslim. Like it's not very easy because they come very, they're already very strong and trained in the thing. But uh, what we see is that when, when God touches their hearts and God opens their hearts, then the revelation comes. And these points of, of difference are things that they understand or they recognize that I can have a relationship with God. God is a loving God. I can, have, I can call him Father. I can have my sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. And so those points, it comes because of revelation, because God opens their heart. Right? Uh, so we, our goal is to present um, Christ, to present the message, and then leave it, uh, leave it to God to open their hearts uh, to know Christ. Is that okay? Any questions, um, classroom and online? Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, Pastor, like, one day what happened is like, yeah, one day what happened is like, I'm trying to reach out a person. So, in here only, Bible college only, so he's a Muslim. Uh, Dynamic is with me. So, she said to pray for him. He's going through on leg pain, something. But uh, we asked to, shall I pray for you? But what he thought is we are praying is a mantra. He, we are using a mantra, something. Yeah. So, like, how to approach a Hindu or Muslim in a prayer way? Like, we should we we are ready for pray for you, but they are thinking in the wrong way. How to approach a person like us? That. Yeah. Yeah. So, very good points. Both Hinduism and Islam, there is room for supernatural. Both. Right? But it is through the practice of black magic, or what we would say, something with the occult. You know, so they have both have room for the supernatural, but it is through it the wrong way. So this is how we would do it. We just say, "Can I pray for you in the name of Jesus?" So tell them very. I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. No black magic, nothing. I'm going to do it in the name of Jesus. So we just ask the permission and we tell them, I'm going to do it in the name of Jesus. Are you okay? You know, we, we can't, uh, we don't want to force anything. Ask them, are you okay? I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. Then we can proceed. You know, so um, some of them, will be open. Sometimes they may say no, but most of the time uh, they are open to it. Yeah, yeah, pray. And then when they experience something, then it's when we can point them to Jesus. Uh, sometimes we may not be able to, for example, if they, uh, especially, um, we have, it can happen in both Hindu and Muslim, that they are wearing something, you know, like a black thread amulet on the hand here and all that. You know, they'll be wearing something. You can see, always oh, wearing something. But those are signs of some prayers and dedications that they have done in the temple or wherever, you know. Uh, sometimes, 
uh, we may have to tell them, see, uh, I can pray for you, but you need to take that off. Uh, are you OK? Are you open? We can't force it. We can't force it, right? They might feel insulted also, insulted, but we can ask, are you okay? Now, if a person is demon-possessed and is manifesting, uh, then if there is somebody there, say, hey, some relative and all, then he would cut it off, take it off. It's a, because that usually is what is giving that e demonic power right over that person. Because they have prayed and said, I'm, you know, I'm giving my body to you, or whatever prayer they would have prayed and made that um, dedication. So that's when, uh, with permission, you know, either that same person or with thing, say, can we take it off, or can you take it off? Better, better is like you take it off. Like others, they will accuse us. So you come in, you came in, cut it on. So you tell them you take it off. Then they will take it off. And then we can minister deliverance and things. So, or as soon as they are ministered, then you tell them you take it off. You know, don't keep it on. Because it, it's a dedication they've made to something. Yes. Those things. Sometimes the demon, the reaction manifestation is very bad at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I've seen ministries. I tell them to remove, yeah. and they'll remove. That is the time uh, the manifestation is there. Yeah. And uh, after that, they get complete deliverance after prayer. Only if they remove. Yeah. So because of that dedication that was made, you know, so that that um, whatever they bear then is part of that dedication over their life. So it gives them in the demonic power access to them. So we tell them to take it off and then lead them in a prayer saying, I cancel and I break every dedication in the name of Jesus. Then you know, they can experience the Yes. So the other question and this for our understanding. So it's written in God, the angel Gabriel gave all this revelation. Mm -hmm. for, as you told that there is nothing good uh, about Muhammad. You can no example, you cannot say any example. So now so in the coming days, so the coming days is a revival time. And how we have to because uh, sometimes which is this for only our understanding. Mm. And this completely, the revelation comes from the uh, demonic, uh, this are we call it, demon plan. Mm. So most of the people are affected. Most of the Muslims, you know, the millions of people saw the plan of evil. Yeah. And this is a very, very big uh, uh, warfare. So we have burden for souls and we have burden for Muslims also to come. To. So only we, through prayer we are doing. But yes. some areas uh, they will come and ask questions, and uh, argument will be there. And how to avoid that, or how to say, we can in front of people, we cannot argue, bring an argument that will become uh, right. different. Because my ministry, many Muslims will come mm -hmm. for prayer, they get many miracles as you told, they receive miracles and they'll go back. Most of the people, the Muslim miracle, one Muslim converted. And uh, even they are also the relation through relations, they are not receive complete deliverance. Mm -hmm. When they come here, uh, they'll will they get deliverance. They'll go back and again they'll have the same thing. So very difficult uh, them to obtain the salvation completely. So this, this is really very challenge, mm -hmm. and we have to face. And uh, we cannot educate them. So once we educate them, they'll go and tell the relations. So that will be. <laughs> Uh, only uh, love of Christ only we can say, and the Holy Spirit will uh, lead them in the truth. Mm -hmm. And so, little challenges, so right. the, uh, sharing. Hindus is okay because it's a very challenging only for uh, these uh, Muslims. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is definitely. Uh, it's a challenging, but uh, the most uh, of the testimonies are when. It's, it's really a, a supernatural work that God does in their lives, you know, that somehow God opens their mind and heart to know Him. Uh, of course, we do our part, you know, whatever, you know, sharing the gospel, praying for them, ministering to them, but we leave it, you know. 
and then the rest God has to do is to open their hearts and minds and uh, make that decision you know like uh, even in one of our locations like this a full Muslim family uh, even I'm surprised like how I mean the, the, some of the family members are still like you know they just come and go but one person is like really committed so even I am surprised. Surprise means like how this person is so committed. And it's only a work of God. Uh, whereas the rest of the family, uh, they just come and go like yeah, this. You know, so uh, we can share the do our part in sharing and leave the rest yeah to God. So some of the people will say like uh, the God who Christians used to worship and the God who Muslims used to worship is the same God. Christianity and the Islam are, are the two ways to reach Father Yahweh. What about that? Most of the Muslims of my friends also they used to say like this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so we have to. Um, so you know, so if you if you look at that, if you look at it that way, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, we could put it all side by side, you know, uh, because they kind of trace back to somewhat a similar origin abraham you know a common ancestor a patriarch of the faith so that way but it's still very different so when so the so the basic question is is the allah whom the muslims worship the same god of whom the Christians worship is he the God of the Bible? So that's the question, right? Is Allah whom the Muslims worship the same God whom the Christians worship, or the God of the Bible? The answer is no, because the God of the Bible is a triune God, and Jesus is part of the Godhead. He is the Son of God. Do Muslims embrace Jesus? No. Right. And the God of the Bible is a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do Muslims have that same thing? No. Secondly, the, the way is very different. If you say you go to Allah through Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad and Jesus, very different, very different. Prophet Muhammad was a man. He's saying Jesus is God who became man. So how can two totally different ways lead you to the same destination? Right? And we say like Prophet Muhammad did not die for your sins and did not do the very thing. Adam brought us under sin. But who brought us out of that? Jesus brought us out of that. And he could do it because he was sinless. Not so in this case. Right? So the the to put Prophet Muhammad alongside Jesus is like totally different. It's like night and day. Totally different. And Jesus said very clearly, you cannot come to the Father except through. If you're reaching some other Father, <laughs> that is different. If you want to go to the Father, it's only through. So there is no way we can say that the Allah whom the Muslims worship is the same God of the Bible whom the Christians worship. No, very different. Yeah, it's very different. 
Sir, little bit similar. Let till Ab Abraham. The stories are little bit similar. Right? We we from Isaac like that. They'll compare. The contradiction came from this point where after Abraham, right? Before and all. See, uh, they used to worship the God of Abraham. So what they say is the God of Abraham is Allah. We also used to we worship God of Abraham. The God of Abraham is Yahweh. That's where the point divides, right? Like like that in that context, they'll say like uh, the people who worship. The Christians and the Muslims are the same. Um, I understand the argument that is, okay, we're starting with the God of Abraham. But it's also important how we worship the one whom we call God. You know, so uh, I think um, an example that we can look at is in Acts you know, 17 when Paul is in Athens and he sees, okay, there are all these idols, so many gods. They even have one idol to the unknown God, altar, to the unknown God. Now Paul is coming and talking to them and he says, this unknown God whom you're worshipping, I'll tell you how to worship, who He is, and how to worship Him. And it is through Jesus Christ. So although he's referring to the unknown God, he does not say, all these ways that you have is okay. See, they have many ways. They already had many idols, many idols. So he says, hey, I see you're very religious people because you've got so many Idols. You even have an altar that says to the unknown God. So I'll talk to you about the unknown God. But that unknown God you approach through Jesus Christ. Right? So he doesn't tell them you can approach him through all these ways. No. You approach that unknown God through Jesus. So I understand this argument about Abraham, but then the the God whom we worship and how we worship Him is also very important. That we have to worship Him through Jesus. Otherwise, if we take another approach, you're not ending up with the same God. Yeah. So we have to be very um, careful uh, about this. Um, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Any other questions? Francis? Uh, so in uh, their religious books, like their help for, but I don't know which part is that Muhammad is saying like, uh, the Jesus Christ is their prophet is, uh, he's directly mentioning like us, Jesus Christ is the son of God. So if you are saying to a Muslim like us this, like your Quran is only saying like us this, it will become a, is not become an argument like is it a good way to share gospel to them like your your Muhammad only saying is like Jesus Christ is the son of God it will become a good way or is it a not a good way like, mm -hmm. so um, yeah so I, I did meet one person and I think he's in I forget where he's based in now uh, maybe not but I have his number but but he, he was actually studying to be an imam. He, had, he was enrolled in uh, one of their uh, colleges in Kerala, under working under priest and all that, a uh, Muslim, Muslim priest. So he was training to become an imam. Very powerful testimony. And he... While he was studying the script, the Quran, he saw some reference to Jesus. So he went and got the Bible to study that because there's a reference, like what you were saying. So he explained to me pers personally, and he was saying, This is how I have so very interesting how you came to faith in Christ and 
Today he's a preacher of the gospel and a minister. But his whole journey was, he was starting to be an imam. He read the Quran. Then from there he went to discover what is in the Bible. Then he started studying the Bible very seriously. Because he's a scholar. And eventually he came to faith in Christ and came out of you know this whole thing. And uh, being a imam, and, uh, he had his own challenge and journey. So that was how so that was how God worked in his life. But I think for us, we are outsiders. Right? For us to go and tell them, hey, you read in your Quran, it's talking about Jesus. It's very difficult. I think only God has to use it. So in this particular case, and probably in in some other cases, that mention of something in the Quran about Jesus prompted you know, him to go and find out. And God used that. Uh, but I think for us to go and tell people, I think we should avoid it because we won't be able to, uh, you know, explain further or defend things further and, and can get in an argument. But if God uses it, like how it, in this example, God actually did that. You know, God, that he read it, then he went and started searching and, you know, uh, and so on. So I think it's better that we let God use that than us going and doing it because we won't be able to handle all the additional questions that come up and uh, arguments and debates uh, if people want to argue back and forth. You know. um, but God has used these kinds of things to uh, bring people to faith in Christ. Yeah. Go ahead, Francis. So, like the same thing in Hindu Vedas also there. So we can use like same thing. God will use like we should not use like as this. Like in Veda, I don't know which Veda they are saying Prajapati. It's like yes, the one person is dying for our sin. So in case like Pastor said, this is not a good way like to approach. God will use for Hindus also is like same perspective. Yeah. So if, if God uses that as a trigger to or as a pointer to cause people to go and search for the truth, that is fine. But if we start getting in, then, you know, uh, there's a lot of additional things that come, more questions that come, which we will not be able to handle. I think we should. Oh, so that's why that's my perspective, is to avoid, you know, saying, hey, go read your Quran, or go read your uh, <laughs> Vedas and find out. If God uses it, it's fine, you know. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, so this is it very today in a, in a nutshell, we said, look, um, when we present the gospel, when we present the message of Jesus to a Hindu and a Muslim, uh, present it very simply, uh, be aware of the main points of difference. And this is what it is. We present that, but then ultimately salvation comes from the Lord. You know, God has to open their hearts. Uh, so let the Lord you know, uh, open their hearts and let them uh, experience Oh. Okay, so Chaya shares one the mention of another lady who came to know from a Muslim lady who came to know the Lord, uh, 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 and uh, and she found Jesus and then wrote a book. Yeah, Jatin shares um, we should avoid using it because they can point us back to Quran and say this is what told in the Quran may in another in that sense, but yeah. So we want to avoid unnecessary debates about, you know, what the Quran says, what the Vedas say, and so on. And we, we are not in a position to handle all of that. Okay? All right. So we're going to change topic. So our next topic, and I'll just introduce that topic, and we will pick it up next week. Okay. So next two weeks, I'm going to be traveling. Um, uh, on, uh, I'll be traveling on missions uh, next week and the week after. But what I'll do is I will record the class. First, I'm going to try to see if my schedule will allow me to connect remotely. But if I cannot re connect remotely, I will make sure I record the lecture. I'll put it up on video uh, in the classroom so you can listen to it. But um, the next topic is about suffering. Lesson number 15. Um, in 
here, uh, uh, what we want to do, lesson number 15, is try to understand uh, why is there suffering? Or what are the reasons there is suffering? And what should our mindset be towards all the suffering that is in the world? Right? So we need to get clarity on this and um, also have the, the right perspective on this. Otherwise, sometimes believers, as believers, we end up blaming God for things He is not doing. God, you're responsible. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so when we say, have mercy on me, oh God, God is probably telling us, you have mercy on me. You're <laughs> blaming me for everything. You know. Uh, so many of us, uh, I mean, vast I think of us believers, because we don't have the right perspective on suffering, sometimes we blame God for those kinds of things. And so uh, we need to get a, get you know, a biblical perspective, get a clear understanding on suffering and then uh, so you know we can have that and then when people ask us questions uh, we will be able to provide uh, the right answers okay so that will be our next lesson I will um, I'll see uh, I'll make sure that some you know videos are recorded I'll record it at home and upload into the classroom so you can uh, just follow that uh, so please bear with me uh, for the next two weeks this is like um, just last few mission trips that I had committed to doing uh, this year. Okay. Uh, any questions? All right. Okay. Let's close in prayer for today. Could uh, somebody please pray? And then we'll wrap up our class today. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. Thank you, Jesus. We understood about how to share the gospel among Hindus and Muslims. Lord, let this uh, uh, lesson will help us in an understanding way. And uh, wisely, we have to share this gospel. Oh God, help us. Thank you, Jesus, for the teacher. Thank you, Jesus, all the students who learned here. Bless us for the Glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Bye now.